Good evening and welcome to six o'clock with Sock now that we have moved to Thursdays. I have a new venue, folks. I am back at the office, although we're not open to the public. Give me a second while I welcome our Spanish speaking um, neighbors and so that they can get the program uh, translated uh, simultaneously in Spanish. Buenas tardes, bienvenidos a 6 p.m. con SAC este jueves. Este, que hemos cambiado el programa ahora para jueves en vez de cada día. Como pueden ver, estoy en un nuevo ambiente que es en mi oficina. He regresado a mi oficina, aunque no estamos todavía abierto al público. Si quieren traducción en español, por favor, llaman al número que aparece en la pantalla que es 646-749-3122. Cuando le contestan su llamada, compartan el código que también aparece en la pantalla, que es 779-328-221. Gracias. My name is Tammy Rivera. I am SOC's Executive Director and Lead Organizer, and I'm very happy to be with you um, this morning. We have a very meaningful forum, short but sweet. Um, I want to ask you, first of all, um, if you are joining us today, let us know you're here. I'd like to say hello to you. I'm missing some of our super fans um, because the staff was doing a great job of uh, moderating and hosting this forum without me. And that tells me that I've done a good job, but I'm back sort of filling in the gaps for some folks and I'd like to say hello. So if you're with us, just drop a line and say hello. And that way I can say um, hi back and, and welcome you individually. Um, we are really thankful for also the team that puts this forum together. So I want you to know that Marisol um, is producing, um, Marisol from our team is producing. You can't see her, but she's in the background making everything happen. She's also doing um, comments, so really uh, appreciative of her. And then we have Miranda on the interpretation line, and she's one of our consultants, making sure folks can access it. We're going to start off right away um, bringing our guest with us, one of my favorite people in the community, uh, Yuseli Flores. She is the racial and economic justice advocate for Organizing Wisconsin Democracy Campaign. And she's going to talk to us about fair maps. Um, and it's a topic that we're all learning about, including myself. I've been a participant in what happens with our census information and how that creates maps that we get represented in. Um, but I've never led in that process, and SOC has decided to lead in that process. So if we can give a warm welcome to Yuseli. Is Yuseli with us? Hi, Sally. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. I'm actually outside. Um, I thought about coming to support local, but the music is really loud inside. I'm at Tres Hermanos on a Mexican Independence Day, as you know. Um, so I thought about how can I support local? There are no coffee shops nearby that I know that I could just go and chill and, and buy some Latino uh, horchata coffee. Um, <laughs> so I'm here at uh, Tres Hermanos waiting on my margarita, um, ready to celebrate. I'd like to thank everybody for the invitation, for having me on, Tammy. Um, I actually drew some maps with your youth and um, the Gold Sock Institute. And I want to apologize because I actually have some really, really, really bad news in regards to those maps oh, that we drew. Okay. Yeah. So we'll if get you, into that in yeah. a minute. Yeah. Um, again, thank you for being with us. We love Tres Hermanos. They've been a longtime supporter of Sock way before I even arrived. Um, and yes, it's Mexican Independence Day. So Thank you for uh, lifting that up and celebrating with folks. And bueno, eh, te, te felicito eh, para tu pueblo y tu gente también. Um, I congratulate you and celebrate with you and your people as I have a Mexican Rican mixed home myself. Um, yes, yes. Okay, so how about give us the bad news first and then we'll get the good stuff. Yeah, so um, unfortunately, Robin Voss introduced some legislation and introduced his own website 
um, for folks to submit a map. So I'm going to share my screen and kind of just walk folks really quickly through what that means. Um, give me a, a, a little second. Um, can, you, can you tell folks who, who are not as in the yeah. mix as us who Robin Voss is and what it means that he introduced a, a website instead right. of the so, one we were working from? So um, as you can see my web, um, essentially we were, you, we were using uh, District R. It's districtr.org slash Wisconsin. You would go to draw communities and you still can do this, right? You're going to go to draw communities. You're going to uh, go to identify a community built out on, you know, 2020 block. Um, on the upper hand screen, you can search for your address. Then you're going to click save. So what you end up doing is um, you click you click save. Once you save, you download as a CSV file and then you go to his website. Um, which is drawyourdistrict.legis.wisconsin.gov. I'll share all of this on um, on our on the comments section. You're going to scroll all the way down to the bottom, and you're going to click submission page. This is this is las malas noticias or the bad news. It says we recommend that you use plans created on or after September 1st, 2021. So when I was with the youth, I was with the youth um, July uh, 19th, and so unfortunately. It's September 1st, right? So you go to the submission page. Once you, um, you basically follow the exact same thing that you would do on district or your contact information. We recommend putting, you know, Southside Organizing Center's address. You don't necessarily need your address. You only need your city, your state, and your zip code. Um, if you're affiliated with any organization or not, then you click community of interest, small submission regarding the map that you drew, choose the file. Again, once you save it onto the district, our website, you would uh, save it as a CSV and re-upload it up on this website. So um, let me stop my share. So those are the bad news. The bad news is that if you made a map, a community of interest map, like the one that I made with the youth and the Gold Institute, you have to resubmit it and we have to remake it, uh, which is fine. I love being with Soft and I will remake any maps that we have to um, and we'll just re-upload it, right? The more if we get another ring of fire, we're ready to jump through it. Like, you know, absolutely. This is, you know, so to offer people some context regarding, you know, fair maps and regarding this, uh, this legislation, I want to take us back about 10 years. So um, in, in 2011, um, the, there was a huge legal challenge. It was Valdez versus Brennan, which was a panel of three judges uh, declared two assembly districts in Milwaukee as an unconstitutional violation of the Federal Voting Rights Act, which gave us more, more seats in Congress. Right. So this was 2011. We got some more seats. We actually uh, one of the organizations that we actually work with, Voces de la Frontera, won a lawsuit saying, hey, uh, there's more community, Latino community um, on the south side than what you actually have on these maps. We just have representation. So one organization out of 26 organizations that were working on fair maps actually won something in 2011. What we're trying to do that is that we're trying to, you know, avoid as much as possible um, going into lawsuits, right? We want to make sure that the money that 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 the money that is exists for communities goes to communities and it doesn't sit um, going back and forth paying attorneys, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I don't know if you remember, there was a huge rigging of maps in 2011 as well. I do. So, um, they like swept to power, taking over control of the assembly, the Senate, the governor's office. Um, they also decided to dream redraw maps that weren't accessed by the public in the Wisconsin uh, capital. They actually literally locked locked, um, locked themselves in the capital with a really pricey law firm, um, which is, you know, was across the street from the capital. Media wasn't allowed in, public wasn't allowed in, Democrats weren't allowed in. Um, even Republican legislators who were not in leadership had to ask to be let into that locked room. Um, and once they got to see their own redraw districts, they had to sign an oath of secrecy you know, our goal is to avoid, you know, avoid 2011 for by all means. So now um, what folks can do, you know, we can contact and urge our legislators to support state maps. Um, there's a Senate bill 389 and assembly bill 395. Um, it's modeled after Iowa. So Iowa um, actually gives an example of like what, um, 
what an actual uh, fair, ma fair map is. And um, so there's, you know, in, in Wisconsin, we want folks to adopt the Iowa model. You can contact your legislator. Um, it's really, really easy. You know, they were a, a reminder that they work for us. Like legislators, state representatives, they work for us. So if we have a comment, we have direct access to them. Um, it's really easy to find who your legislator is and how you can contact them, you know, if you wanted to come to action. This is a nonpartisan issue, right? Democrats and Republicans benefit from rig maps. What we're trying to do is to make it as uh, nonpartisan as possible. So that's just to offer some historical context. You know, we want to avoid those locked doors that happened 10 years ago. We want to make sure that communities of interest, like Latino communities, our Southeast Asian uh, communities, also have access to um, fair representation. Este, and so the work that has gone, gone before, all we need to do is circle back, folks and then re-upload it to the new website. And we're very used to people changing the rules to try to discourage us. So we already know that's the lucha. We've been doing it all of existence and we will circle back. And so yeah. what's really exciting about all of this, um, even though it's new for SOC to get involved at this level yeah. of, of leadership in redistricting um, is that it continues the work, right? that we have started with the census. So the census is not just an activity that is in vain or is singular, but that information is going to be contributed and and um, into incorporated into this process of yeah. what districts do we live in? Who gets to represent us and how many people get to represent us, right? Yeah, yeah Can you that's give exactly it. Okay, can you give people a sense? So I know we're rushing through this, folks, because we only have like time to introduce it to you. Yeah. If, yeah. if you're interested, if you're interested in digging in with us to say, hey, I would like to contribute or learn about yeah. how we create um, some suggestions to law to to the law holders and makers of what is a community of interest people so, have things in common yeah i i want to bring up that um like everything you said regarding the census yes yeah, so the census isn't just so you get counted the census also brings you know literal billions of dollars into the state every year based on how many people were counted and then that's how these maps are drawn based on census data so that's why the reason we have to resubmit any maps that we did do with SOC was because we just received a, a clean new census data for 2020 um 2020 and um we actually have some amazing events we have um the fair maps coalition legislative lobby day which is again it's a nonpartisan event it's basically um getting more fair map supporter around the state together virtually to meet with legislators so um i'm going to share the link with you for people Excellent. to register so you can put it put it right on your um right on the live and right on the web uh the description of the um today's conversation um, we are offering a lobby day training. So like if you've never spoken with your legislative uh, um, representative, now's your chance, right? Silvia Ortiz Velez represents my district. Thankfully, I'm friends with her on Facebook. So if I have an issue, I can just send her a Facebook message. But if you don't have that same relationship, this is the space to build that, right? This is the space to ask them to support Fair Maps. Um, whether de Democrats, Republicans, that doesn't matter. What matters is the people that live in these communities. So the people that filled out the census are the ones should that should accurately be represented um, on these maps. And I guess with the Fair Maps Commission and with the Fair Maps Coalition, that's what we're trying to do. Um, and I, you know, the, going through the um, the process of filling out the, um, the invitation for Monday is very easy. It's a Google form. You basically just need your name, your last name. It does ask for your street address, but that is not really a requirement. The reason we require a zip code is to know who your state representative is in order to assign folks to the right room the day of. Um, but yes, it's this issue is an ongoing issue. And if we don't do anything about it, we'll be stuck where we are for the next 10 years up until 2031. And I don't know if, you know, I'll be here in 2031. I'll do another live with SOC if I have to in 2031. <laughs> keep fighting because we should, you know, we should keep fighting. This is this is our block. This is our barrio. These are our people. And um, they deserve representation. So there's all kinds of way, folks, that uh, Yuseli has shared that you can get involved. 
you can learn how to make a map and submit it with our help and her help. You can learn how to be trained to talk on lobby day, talk to your officials. You can participate in talking with them and you can contact them even if you don't participate in that specific lobby day to get involved. Um, could you give us a sense of the timing of what's happening moving forward, Yuseli, the timeline? Looks, it sounds like you're on, okay, go ahead. All right, sorry. Yeah, so, um, well, yeah, I didn't realize how loud folks were gonna be. We're, you know, we're celebrating a huge day. Um, sure. So, our, one of our biggest issues right now is that we, um, once we submit these maps and one, once these maps are submitted, the goal is to take these two legislation and say, hey, we have hundreds of maps that actually represent communities. We want you to take a look at them with your nonpartisan attorneys. What we want to avoid is uh, Republicans or Democrats hiring their own attorneys and then saying like, hey, we want this firm to represent to represent us. No, we want a nonpartisan firm with, you know, hundreds of these um hundreds of these maps, you know, lay, they can layer them on top of each other to kind of make one big map that accurately, accurately represents folks. Um, we also have simultaneously the budget process is going on. So that's kind of like the reason why all of this kind of overlaps. Um, but once maps go to the governor, he can choose, you know, different different parties were introduced different maps, right? Then he, then these go to the governor, these go to, to legislation. Once they're, in, once they're in the hands of, you know, attorneys, and once attorneys cut these maps, they go back to, you know, government, governor. It's almost up to them, right? Then it's like, all right, we want these maps, right? We want those maps. Why we keep encouraging folks to, to draw their own maps and why we keep encouraging folks to use the district art program and then submit them, you know, to Robin Boss's, um, I, I guess, website is basically to try to avoid this uh, this whole lawsuit fiasco. So um, let's say, OK, you know, maps make it might make their way to legislation. Maps are done and maps are approved. They, you know, they, they go back and they represent it. They go back, communities have access to these maps. And this is where we just, we want to avoid that process of having to having to sue, having to to fight like Voces de la Frontera fought in 2011 and spending resources that should be going, again, an organization that already is underserved and doesn't have the resources, having to invest the time to just accurately make sure that communities are represented we're trying to avoid a lot of these things by um, having community of interest maps being submitted straight into the commission. There's a fair maps commission. That commission will um, obviously are the mediators between uh, attorneys and between uh, legislators to make sure that we have these accurately represented maps um, by the end of the year so they could be implemented for the next 10 years. Um, because census right. data was late, this map, the timeline is obviously backed up. Um, but we really, um, you know, are, are urging, are encouraging communities to just draw their own maps based on how they see them in their communities. Um, and do we do we yeah. know if there, if the if the mediation, they accept maps and they're uncontested in court? Do we have a sense of when when they get implemented, when they start using those maps? Oh, we can't hear you. Look, it sounds. Okay. Accidentally okay. gone. I, I have like my two tabs open. Okay. So, um, all right. They can submit maps until what date? Do we know that one? We you have, um, Ryan, they, you can keep submitting maps. Um, All the, the way People's through Maps the Commission will continue. People's Maps Commission. Let me give you an accurate, um, an accurate uh, timeline. Um, all right. So I'm just trying to see if I could share my screen with this timeline. Um, That's fine. We're with you. Yeah. All right. So. People can submit maps. Give me a second. I'm sorry. Um, That's fine. 
while you while you look for it, I'm gonna say hello to some folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's with us today that we can say hi to? Ah, hola, Stacy. Stacy Carlos is our most recent organizer. She's been with us for a long time. Um, in different ways, she helped us do our anti-displacement outreach when there's a there's a fund available for people in Walker's Point um, to tap into if they have tax increases, if they qualify for the program. And um, she also did some canvassing, phone canvassing for us last year. And now she's on staff full time as an organizer for our West District, is which is 16th Street to Miller Parkway and Pierce Street to Beecher. So welcome, Stacy, and glad to see you here. Ah, and we have Mujeres con Poder de Transformar, de Transformación Social. Buenas tardes a ustedes. All right, um, I'm going to share my screen real quick just to give you this accurate, um, it's a great time. Um, so um, we are basically between September 15th and October 18th. Um, so right now um, we're basically um, creating these, these counties. They're holding public hearings right now. We're uh, holding public hearings to demand fair maps, right? The lobby day of action is between these days, which uh, basically reaching out to legislatives, reaching out to, to our representatives. And then after receiving these, these counties, tentative uh, district plans and municipalities are gonna adjust their ward boundaries. Uh, they, they actually transmit their ward plan back to their counties by October 18th. So this is kind of like, a, I, I guess you can see it in the, in the map. Um, they'll submit it back to their municipalities by October 18th. Then the common council of every city must redistrict the boundaries of its aldermanic districts by an ordinance introduced at a regular meeting of the council. You know, this is all like the, the legal things. Um, after that's been submitted, um, everything should be in accordance and, you know, accomplished by November 10th. So then we're November 3rd to the 10th, counties uh, contempor uh, contemporaneously hold public <coughs> hearings and then they adopt final county plans. Um, then county and municipal clerks, um, just they, you know, they publish the notice um this is kind of the um the local redistricting timelines um that go hand in hand with our statewide redistricting timelines um which is kind of amazing to know that we have access to um to a timeline like this i'll make sure that you have a link to it to post you know to remind folks to post on on, on your socials um to kind of put a little bit more pressure on elected officials on local elected officials and um uh, and make sure that we're just accurately seeing our communities on maps, how they are every time we drive past them. Great. Now, let me take care of some logistical questions yeah. before we end here, Yuseli. So if people um, want to participate in this, obviously they can contact SOC. And who can they contact at your location? at your organization. Yeah, so um, I am a part of the Fair Maps lead team. So the Fair Maps Coalition is made up of about 26 different organizations all over the state. Um, as a lead team member, they can contact me directly. Um, I'll add my um, email to the, um, to the chat. To the chat. And, let's, and then let's share that out loud and then we'll share yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, Flores, so Yuseli Flores at WISDC.org, F-L-O-R-E-S at WISDC.org. Um, they can always reach out to me, subject line, you know, fair maps, and I can more than more than likely, if I can't do it, I know somebody that will be able to connect them. Um, but we do need as many community of interest maps uh, re-uploaded if you, we did make one prior to September 1st. Uh, from District R going to the uh, the draw your district that ledges that Wisconsin .gov. Um, we don't want to give anybody a reason, you know, to say that we didn't submit enough maps because you know we made hundreds of them um, over a span of you know six months. Absolutely, and then yeah. let's share with people. There is no cost to be involved with any of the options we talked about, right? This is completely free. Um, this is completely accessible to all communities. As a Spanish speaker myself, I know how difficult it is to like kind of get this conversation going with our parents, with our elders who may not speak English. So I'm more than welcome, more than more than open and willing to you know translate the, the website for folks. Um, 
try and have these conversations in Spanish as, as much as we need them. So you, you heard it, folks. Yeah. Uh, and is there a, a, for old schoolers, is there a phone number that they could call if they are not? So folks can actually submit um, written testimony to the People's Maps Commission. You can, if you don't want to make a map, if this feels, you know, too out of your league, um, you can submit your own comment. It's a public comment to People's. I just shared the, um, just shared the link with you. Um, please, you know, they, uh, technically speaking, like legislatives and representatives have, anytime they get mail, anytime they get a phone call, they need to keep record of that. So the more we submit things to the People's Maps Commission, the more we talk to our legislators, the more that they need to keep record of this. Excellent. Well, um, enjoy your evening um, celebrating Mexican Independence Day. Thank you as always for your generous amount of time and helpfulness and be safe. Gracias. Mi lucha es su lucha siempre. Así es. Hasta luego. Okay. Uh, lots of information may seem a little overwhelming, but remember that we're with you in it. So this is a quick intro and the point of it is to get your involvement about what, what your opinion is about natural districts in your community, groups of interest, people who need, who have similar things in common, who need to be represented. Uh, we're going to move on to my uh, typical section, which is the critical updates. And for me, it's to sh share with you and celebrate. Yes, today is Mexican Independence Day. And yesterday kicked off Hispanic Heritage Month. And it goes from yesterday until um, October 15th. And so I wanted to share how we kicked off yesterday because um, we had some technical difficulties and I, I, not us, but the, 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 the activity we participated in. So I want to assure you it's still happening and remind you uh, what we did to kick off Hispanic, Hispanic Heritage Month. Uh, we were invited by State Representative Marisabel Cabrera, our, our representative here. We have two of them, her and Silvia Ortiz Velez, to participate in the Wisconsin Latino Caucus Hispanic Heritage um, virtual kickoff event. And I, I am so glad that we accepted the invitation. It was such a meaningful event. The intent was for several, three panels, three different sessions of information and panelists to go um, live, but there was some technical difficulties. So I just want to assure you it's coming. They will upload the event and then we'll share it. But I want to tell you what took place because you don't want to miss this. Um, they were able to round up some of um, the greatest, you know, thought thinkers, researchers, leaders, elected officials on a few topics um, that I think you'll find very interesting as we go into Hispanic Heritage Month. Yes, we want to celebrate with food and dance and getting together, but also we have some very serious um, issues that impact our community. And so I'm very grateful for um, the Latino Caucus to put on that event and to invite us. So the first session um, of panelists was about, you know, what are the biggest drivers for economic growth? And I want to share with you some of the topics that were covered and who spoke on it, uh, because I think it's really important for you to stay informed, but um, also to know about resources and to understand what's happening. Um, so they talked about what the Chamber of Com the Latino Chamber of Commerce um, do. So we have a state um, ch a chamber, Latino Chamber of Commerce, that's out of Madison. But we have a local Latino Chamber of Commerce, which is one of our strategic partners, as you know, if you've been with us. And um, we're doing, um, we're partnering with them again next Friday for the second annual on Summit, where if you are wanting to be uh, open your business or have a business, you'll want to attend that. And we'll share again, we've shared it on our Facebook and we'll share again the details where you can register, et cetera. And then uh, we got information about like, where are Latino, what sectors are Latinos doing business in? That was interesting. 
Uh, how has that changed over time? How impactful the Latino business businesses are to the entire um, economy and that data, that was fascinating. And then what impact do Latino workers have on businesses? And um, what are the struggles over, you know, what are the struggles seen in that environment? But also what struggles did the pandemic create? Um, and then what is the purchasing power of Latinos, which is massive, um, and ha how that has helped grow the economy? Um, and then how different would the economy be if you subtracted Latino businesses, the Latino workers, and Latino purchasers, consumers? Uh, so that was super, super fascinating and interesting. And I'll just share a little fact with you here on the near south side of Milwaukee, which is, you know, three by three miles, First Street to Miller Park, like Pierce Street to, to Oklahoma, um, we have... 650,000 aggregate, meaning combined, purchasing power per mile in this area. But a lot of our purchasing is outside of that district. Uh, but imagine if we can turn some of that purchasing back in the district, how that could change our uh, economy here in this area. That was the first panel on economy. Um, and then the speakers were uh, our very own Nelson Soler, who is the founder, president, and CEO of the Latino Chamber of Commerce of Southeastern Wisconsin, which is the uh, um, the one we get to partner with next Friday for the second annual Unsummit. And then um, also a dear friend and colleague as well, Jessica Cavazos, who's the president and CEO of the Latino Chamber of Commerce that's located in Dane County, but her uh, perspective or her reach is the whole state. And then Dr. Armando Ibarra, who's an associate professor at UWM, who has so much research and data on this topic. It was just amazing. The second panel, this is the panel that I got to participate in, was the growing and evolving political community um, of Latinos. And so uh, things we talked about, how many Latinos are there in the US and in the state um, who can vote? And how many Latino voters turned out in 2020? And why did we think that happened? what uh, issues are important to Latinos and how have those changed? And then how is the younger generation of Latinos approaching politics, um, you know, different from maybe previous generations? And then who do Latino voters tend to support and why in elections? Why are Latinos, more Latinos running for office? And what um, impact do we see Latinos are making on the topic we talked about today, redistricting? And then um, Latino voters, we have doubled our share of the nation's voters uh, since 2000 uh, presidential election. So given this trend, um, is it possible to win a presidential election without a Latino vote? Um, when that gets posted, go watch it and see if you agree or don't. And then can we expect Latino vo voters to turn out in high numbers next fall for 2022 for the presidential election? And so you don't want to miss that. On the panel was myself, of course, um, from SOC and uh, another incredible um you know, researcher and um, academic and scholar, Dr. Ramon Ortiz. He's the Dean of MATC in Madison. Um, and then we had our very own history making register of deeds, Israel Ramon, um, who was the first ever appointed um, Latino regist county register of deeds. And he, we think the only um, register of deeds uh, who was born in Mexico and then uh, became um, a U.S. citizen um, here. So that was a fascinating panel. And then all of us came back together to talk about the last piece. What does the census tell us about um, the Latinos, uh, uh, our demographics, and how is this going to affect schools and the education system? That was interesting. A conclusion is if you pulled out Latinos from the school systems, 
many school systems would fail because of the sheer number of pulling Latinos out of them. And then um, how are Latinos vital in helping the state and the country um, combat you know, this pandemic and recover from it? Um, and how can we ensure their continued support? And then that Latino entrepreneurship has skyrocketed in recent years. So what resources do they need to continue that and to expand? Um, even though we're still sharply behind, but um, there's a movement now on, uh, increasing. And, and how do we rely on all that entrepreneurship and how can that like mutually benefit other communities, which it does. Um, and then what, um, what political parties and candidates build strong lasting relationships with the Latino? No, how can they? How can parties and candidates build relationships um, with people? And then knowing the hard work ethic um, of our community and uh, our commitment to families and community uh, the last question was, what policies, laws, and processes could we change to make a positive impact? So I say that to really encourage you and hopefully tempt you to pay attention here so that when that program is shared, um, you get to hear all those uh, subject matter experts, right? The elected officials, the academics, and community leaders um, hosted by state representative Marisabel Cabrera and Silvia Ortiz Velez representing the Wisconsin Latino Caucus. Um, so please uh, watch out for that uh, so you can uh, participate in that and, and hear all that uh, important information that was shared. Uh, let's move on folks to our next uh, segment. Uh, we have a, uh, our we haven't um, quite, right? Although I'm back in the office, we haven't quite got on the other side of the pandemic. We will continue to bring you information. As a matter of fact, next week, Thursday, we are going to provide you information about what contract contact tracing is. You know, when you do get COVID and you, you get a call um, from a nurse or someone else asking some questions or you fill out a survey to see if we can determine where people are getting um, the virus and you know tr trace that back. So we're gonna get some information from Eloisa Gomez, a contract tracer, another um, longtime colleague of ours um, to figure out that system and why it's important and what is happening in the Latino community. Don't you wanna know how people got COVID? So that'll be important. And then of course, every time we do a COVID segment, we have a guest um, when a, someone from the leadership of the Milwaukee Health Department to give us updates on the current number of COVID cases, testing, and any other pertinent information. So next week's forum is our public health COVID forum. So please be with us. And so we're going to um, share now a COVID video slideshow. And then um, hold on. You have to listen to my voice again for a little bit because I want to read the slides for people who are listening and not viewing uh, the slideshow. So go ahead, uh, Marisol, and share that slideshow. What causes a virus to change? Uh, inside the virus, there are molecules called nucleotides, which form different combinations. It's like a bike lock, but each wheel, but each wheel has four options, right? Um, now imagine that lock has 30,000 wheels. That's the entire genome sequence of a virus. That's how many options. Each time that virus spreads, it copies the sequence, the like bike lock, it copies it, right? But every now and then, as it copies, the wheel slips and the sequence can slip. So those numbers change. Most of the time, these are tiny little changes. Um, don't, um, don't, they don't alter the virus, but sometimes, um, the variations make combos that don't work. This makes the virus a little bit weaker and this strands, that tends to die out that virus. But sometimes it makes it stronger and easier to transmit and more resistant. Those uh, strains can thrive. The good news is 
the current vaccines are desi designed and that in most cases they will work um, you know, against any of those new combos, those new variants. And researcher, uh, researchers are working on ways to tackle those more intense viruses. So a little quick lesson on why, like what, why the Delta variant was born, right? So that was the more severe one, according to this slide. So we're thankful uh, for that information. And then um, next, we want to give you a civic engagement update. And what I want to share with you is um, there is COVID money, ARPA money, that is, that is coming from the federal government to, to our local communities. And we get to have a say about how that money should be used to help us recover from the pandemic. And so the city has been hosting promotions for ARPA meetings and ARPA surveys. and um, so I'm going to announce the next meeting they do, and then um, we're going to go through uh, what Marisol is sharing here, which is if you can attend the meeting, one way you can get feedback is through a survey. Um, so the amount of money is $394 million the city of Milwaukee is receiving for a recovery from COVID. So imagine we get to say about where that money is going to be spent. So Next week, um, Thursday, even though it's in competition with the forum, right at six o'clock on Facebook Live as well, um, and we give you permission to go over there because that's super important. You can come watch our forum later. Uh, there's a link here that Marisol will share um, at the city of Milwaukee that you can participate in that meeting. Um, and if you forget about the link or you don't copy it, just put it in your calendar. Um, the city of Milwaukee Facebook, um, and you should be able to pop it up without having the link. And then if you can't make that meeting, then they have a survey. It's also available in Spanish and Hmong for, uh, for folks. Um, and if you need that, you can go to the city website. Uh, Marisol will put that up and go under ARPA and get it in those other languages. But I just want to show you a little bit about what the survey looks like so you don't feel intimidated. You could just fill it out from home online. So uh, Marisol, can you pull up that web, that link for the survey? And then again, next Thursday at six o'clock on Facebook Live at the city Facebook, city of Milwaukee Facebook, you can participate in the meeting. Este, we don't see it. I'm going to put it in the private chat, Mari, to see if you can pull it up. Because I just want you guys, you all to see that when you go to the website, what it kind of looks like so that you don't feel like, is it going to be, you know, too complicated or too busy? It looks like we're having a little trouble bringing it up. Um, so, oh, here we go. So there it goes. Ah, right there. When you go to the website, can you um, um, let us see the top a little, money? Ah, you can choose right there. Do you want to see it in English, in Spanish, or in Hmong? And they have a little, they have, we'll do English. And then um, they have a little introductory introductory paragraph where they explain a little, little bit. And then if you go down a little bit on that screen, you'll see the questions. And um, there are little boxes you can check. It looks like we're having our screen freeze up a little bit, which happens, folks, with, um, you know, the technology. Um, so we'll go back. We can stop sharing that one. Um, and uh, sorry that, you know, it doesn't always work out with the technology. But you can go to the City of Milwaukee website and Type in ARPA, A-A-R-P-A, and find that survey. It's in our link here. And next Thursday, you can join them to give them some, some input. Listen, if any of the program today was of use to you or former ones, we want you to share that information with us in our survey. So I'm going to have Marisol come and announce it and really encourage you um, to participate um, in it because we use that 
you know, to share with our funders to say that this is useful for you so we can continue it. And it helps us to know what information is helpful and what we need to change. So please fill out the uh, survey. Happy Mexican Independence Day to our community members of Mexican descent. Happy Hispanic Heritage Month to all of us who have Hispanic, Latino, X heritage, and please be safe. Has this live forum been informative and useful to you? What part of the forum could be improved or changed to make it better? Please take a quick survey that's located in the comments section so that we can keep 3 o'clock with SAC going for residents. Thank you for tuning in.